Good morning. Um, so it's uh, just uh, uh, about four minutes before we have to start, but um, in the meantime, uh, if you'd like to make yourself known in the, in chat and where you're from, that'd be good. Uh, my, I would also invite you to um, put in the chat if you've ever experienced a time where uh, you've been thinking about someone and uh, they've suddenly appeared or, or rung up. Um, if, if, if anything like that has happened to you before, um, share it with us uh, in chat. Um, we're going to talk this morning about the power of thought. Um, and uh, uh, it, it can certainly have a, a greater influence on things than we think. I was just reading a few days ago uh, an article by Richard Morrison in the Times, Times Two, where he was talking about his past, um, his past teachers, his past music teachers, and he had one in particular called Charlie, who was his um, uh, organ organ teacher. Let's keep an eye on the time, and. Um, he, uh, th this, this was organ teacher was very influential on him. He started teaching him at the age of 10. And um, <clears throat> he was, he took over from him actually as organist of his church. And <clears throat> he was practicing um, later, later in life, he was practicing um, on the organ in the church. <clears throat> and uh, he said that he, suddenly was aware of somebody behind him. Uh, he could, he could spore that he could even uh, hear the person breathing. And he turned around, there was absolutely nobody there. And uh, uh, completely, as he said, completely spooked, he ran out of the church to, to his parents' home. And as, as his father opened the door, he said, I've got some bad news. Uh, Charlie died last night. So Richard Morrison says that he doesn't believe in ghosts. I think he'd agree that uh, when he says that the, the uh, influence has a greater effect uh, on um, on one than you imagine, um, and he'd probably agree that that um, thought is in this realm as well. Um, so. Um, as I say, um, uh, do make yourself known in chat, and um, and uh, if you have any of these odd experiences. So we're just coming up to just a few more, just a little bit, and then, then we'll start. I'm missing my my watch battery has run out, so I'm, I'm having to rely on my phone. I oh, know there's, there's, there's a clock on my computer. So uh, it is half past, so we'll, we'll get cracking on this. Um, so let's just move this over. So good morning, I'm Nicholas Dematos. I'm a tutor and student in the School of Philosophy and Economic Science. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about James Allen. Let's show you a picture of him. James Allen was born in 1864 in Leicester. His father was what was called a factory knitter. And all that we know of his mother was that whatever uh, her other virtues, she could neither read nor write. In 1879, uh, there was a downturn in the textile industry in the Midlands, and Allen Sr. decided to try the family's luck in the US. He traveled there alone, but within two days, he was attacked and robbed, subsequently dying in hospital. James was 15, with his mother and younger brother to support. He left school and went out to find work. This he found in various manufacturing firms as a private secretary. But in 1893, he moved to London 
and then to South Wales, working in journalism and reporting. In Wales, he met Lily Oram. And uh, here's a picture of her. It's, she's a little bit older here, but it gives you an idea of what she looks like. Um, uh, and he wed her in 1895. Three years later, he became a contributor to the magazine, The Herald of the Golden Age, uh, in which he could showcase his increasing interest in social matters and in the spiritual, and which, he, which also showed the path his career was taking. Thus, he also started writing books, publishing From Poverty to Power in 1901. The following year, he published the first issue of his own periodical, The Light of Reason, uh, which was later renamed The Epoch. The year after that, 1903, he published his most famous book, As a Man Thinketh. The title was taken from the Bible, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The success of this allowed him to give up his secretarial work and, inspired by Leo Tolstoy, devote himself to writing and editing. In this year, too, he moved his small young family to Ilfracombe in Devon. And from here, he kept up an astonishing writing rate of a book a year as well as continuing to produce the epoch. This might be why he died so young at 47 in 1912, but even then he managed to publish 19 works. After his death, his wife Lily continued to publish the epoch. In the preface to his last work, Foundation Stones to Happiness and Success, which was published after his death, Lily wrote of him, he never wrote theories or just for the sake of writing. He wrote when he had a message, and it became a message only when he had lived it out in his own life and knew that it was good. Indeed, in the last word on the leader page of the Times two days ago, there was this quote from William Hazlitt. On the conduct of life, uh, well, uh, his book is called The Conduct of Life, and it was written 42 years before Alan was born. You know more of a road by having traveled it than by all the conjectures and descriptions in the world. Thus, says Lily Allen, uh, James Allen wrote facts which he had proven by practice. You might say in this respect, that he was a precursor to our own school of practical philosophy as well as the harbinger of the self-help movement of the last hundred years. To give an idea of his thought, uh, I'm going to read you his short account of his search for spiritual understanding, which will lead logically into the quote I've put in the chat. I looked around upon the world, and I saw that it was shadowed by sorrow and scorched by the fire of fierce, the fierce fire of suffering. And I looked for the cause. I looked around, but I could not find it. I looked in books, but I could not find it. I looked within and found there both the cause and the self-made nature of that cause. I looked again and deeper and found the remedy. I found one law, the law of love, one life, the life of adjustment to that law, one truth, the truth of a conquered mind and an obedient heart. To be clear, this he doesn't speak here of an externally conquered mind or a, a heart obedient to someone or something else, but of his own self-discipline, which allowed him to say this. And uh, it's in the uh, chat. Act is the blossom of thought, and joy or suffering are its fruits. Thus does a man garner in the sweet and bitter fruitage of his own husbandry. So, from this simple but effective analogy, let's consider what he means. To follow the analogy, he suggests that one's thoughts are seeds which 
or in being given continuous nourishment by our consciousness, turn into things that we actually do. Naturally, after blossom comes the fruit, which will be the result of those actions, whether for good or for ill. Finally, he emphasizes that we alone are responsible for the production of these fruits. Now, there are, uh, there are numerous examples of, of, of this in my own life. Um, you know, I've, I, I've spent my uh, career teaching uh, and um, uh, don't get me wrong, I love teaching, uh, but there was always something at the back of my mind um, where, which, which was an urge to write. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice if uh, I had private means and I could just spend all day writing? Well, sure enough, uh, I've retired uh, and I have an income and I can spend all day writing if I want. Of course, it works both ways. Uh, it, at one point in my career, I found myself teaching um, primary school, very young primary school boys, basically like puppy dogs. And I, I was thinking, oh, I was just, just not cut out for this. And sure enough, I wasn't. <laughs> I had to move jobs and teach older children. Shakespeare uh, puts, uh, puts this brilliantly um, in his tragedy Othello. There's Othello's henchman. Othello is the ruler of Venice and his henchman is Iago. Iago is jealous of, of, of Othello and by means of a handkerchief plants in his mind the notion that his wife Desdemona is, is cheating on him. And sure enough, Othello, this develops in Othello's mind and uh, he, he ends up murdering his wife. So is the lesson of this is, of course, what's your thoughts? Um, take heed of the proverb which says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, uh, if you've uh, enjoyed this video, then uh, like it, share it, um, and um, there will be another Philosophy Live uh, uh, session this time next week. So have a very good week and goodbye.